I just keep seeing the churches, particularly what I call the Euro tribals, constantly obsessed with themselves. Yeah. Uh, even when it comes to how do we social justice better and all that kind of stuff. And there is this, as I pointed out, when it comes to the, what we would call neoliberalism, <clears throat> it is a, to my mind, it is, it's a deeply embedded ideology um, that people don't recognize. And so for most Christians in most churches, it's sort of, well, that's just the way it is. You can't do anything about that. All we can do is hope our pastors can disciple us with a good morality that will ameliorate it. And, yeah. and yet, surely to goodness, I mean, yeah. I look at what's going on in France, where surely to goodness, there's got to be a staring of the spirit uh, that's saying to people, it doesn't have to be this way. Yeah. So, yeah. That's just my, I'm emoting about, so why am I writing this? Is it their, is it their middle classness or is it their Christianity? I know these things are really deeply woven together. Yeah, they're woven together. Yeah. My guess is that, um, so I, I wanted to start with your kind of idea of neoliberalism. So you're, I love this idea that it's actually a political theology. Yeah. That's, that I've never thought of it, but I agree. You know, that, that is where it is, right? It's kind yeah. of saying, here is a worldview, and this is not about economics, here is a worldview, <clears throat> you, your place in the world, you know, you're, you're, you're part of a market, and that's everything. That's not just economics, that's all social relationships. Everything's transactional in neo neoliberalism, right? Exactly. Transactional. And I can see that that would give rise to religions which are kind of transactional in their nature. Right. I, I get national church. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can see that. But I do think that um, there were kind of two things buzzing in my head. The first was that in communities at the margins, the transaction has not been working for so long. Correct. That they are more likely to be the first places that begin to try to model a different type of understanding of who we are and how we live together. Yeah. So, I mean, that was the point I was making really, like about the black market in the East End Church, you know, but it's very active out, you know, it's very active. I couldn't live in the house I do without that. I yeah. had it given to me. I think this is about the fourth car we've had actually just donated to us, free. Yeah. You know, so my whole life runs on that. That's the economic depending of my life. Um, so I know that there's an alternative society well and truly in operation at the margins. What do you do to show that to the middle ground? I'm not sure. I don't think everyone's going to want to move down and be downwardly mobile and come and live in the East End. You know, I'm not foolish. Some should, but not everyone will. Right. I was thinking, is there, is there another alternative for those who want to remain in their context which is harder to see, I think, the kingdom of God in. But I wonder whether there's something to do with, this is just me thinking aloud, you know, is there something to do with the transcendence that they might experience, which is going to give them a different world view than the one that neoliberalism... So I guess I'm talking about, you can either go really low church like me and see it lived out, or you could go really high church and see a kind of worldview which really emphasizes the fact that we are not market, pawns in a market. We live under the sovereignty of an incredibly transcendent God. And therefore, we're not this, these autonomous, rational, you know, kind of um, beings that capitalism might imagine we are. There's something far more mysterious about us all. <coughs> That's what, a very, yeah, what do you make of that? Oh, <clears throat> it's, um, it's what's, well, let me come at it in a different way, because what you're touching on is something that um, has, has kind of been staring me in the face in another area. So I, I'm writing a book with Mark Lab Branson, uh, A Theology of Leadership. And, yeah. and, and so one looks at, 
so much of the leadership models that are proffered in books and other things. And, and um, my, my, my awareness is that so much of these leadership models are based upon an unquestioned conviction about the power of human agency to change and the method of rationality. So, you know, whether it's high fits is, well, you've got to do adaptive change or you've got to be innovative and all these sorts of things. Underneath mm -hmm. it is this deep conviction that with the right methodologies, yeah. we have the agency to change. What's yeah. absent, what's absent when you ask, but who is this God? is any sense of the mystery within which we, we do not have the power to control and make the outcomes we want. And it seems to me that neoliberalism as a theology is itself primarily a, a, um, a testament that human agency is the core meaning in all of life. And what you're getting at is whether we go down, <laughs> to use your language, or high, yeah. it, somehow yeah. we have to be invited back into the mystery, yeah. which means we are not the primary agents in control of the outcomes. Yeah. Am I of making course, the poor, the poor know they're not the primary agents the in control. The poor know that. We, we yeah. know that. Uh, and I say we, but I'm not poor. You know, I live on... I'm not poor. Yeah, we know that. Um, I think the middle ground is where the real shaking's happening because this illusion of being in control. That is correct. Have a transactional faith. Or, you know, that we, we create these illusions. We're very much still children of the Enlightenment, right? Totally. You know, we're yeah. still cutting the thing up to understand it. But at either end of the scale there, there are opportunities possibilities and opportunities for the church to show a whole different picture. Um, how, how do you think, um, let's take uh, middle class people, and part of what you're suggesting is that um, it, it's really, how do we create a, a liturgical life, or a worship life yeah. that presses into the mystery of God's life and God's reality. And in that sense, deconstructs this rational human agency. But to a large extent, and I'm gonna be probably unfair here, so much of that high church liturgy is, is aesthetics. <laughs> um, it becomes middle-class aesthetics, which at the end of the day, to me, is, is, is this Nietzschean, uh, uh, loss of any any belief in the transcendence. I mean, if, if that sounds... I, I do, I, I think I know what you mean. And I, that's why you've got Pentecostalism. That's, that's why you've got what? Pentecostalism. That's why you've got a charismatic movement. Yeah. It's like the working class equivalent of the weird stuff, right? But what you mustn't lose is the weird stuff. Your faith has to make space for the weird stuff. Because otherwise, you're not really worshipping God at all, are you? No. Whether God breaks through with the mm -hmm. and the bells and the, the candles and the beauty, which, hey, I like a bit of that sometimes, you know, or whether God breaks through with the gritty reality of trying to listen to God in a, in a broken environment, or whether God breaks through with signs and wonders type ministries, I just think God is breaking it up. Yeah. God is breaking it up. Yeah. Probably the leaders are having the most problem with this because they're trying to manage this thing, right? They are. That's part of it. Is that um, I mean, for me, what what has um, what is some some of the things that have have created this in me is 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 I watch others come along and they in my working with all kinds of churches and others are coming along and they're presenting like they're creating centers of innovation and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And yeah. deep inside of me, I just go, but this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, 
<laughs> this is one. This is one more round of how we can manage. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, it it how do we get to this engagement with the mystery of God, or the mystery of I can't be in control? Yeah. Uh, because what's I mean to yeah. me neo neoliberalism really said to middle class people, middle class Christians, you are in control. Yeah. And it's it's up to you to maximize yourself economically in all these kinds of ways. Yeah. And here are yeah. the methods, right? Yeah. And, and Jesus will keep you morally right uh, to do this. I mean it, it goes back to John Locke who basically said capitalism is really bad but we if, if we do it for a while we'll raise all the boats up and the way yeah. we'll make it work is that there are still things called homes where women are Christians and they'll ameliorate all the worst part of the men I mean it's no different today right no. yeah but Christianity Christians in middle class euro tribal churches yeah they're just given this morality to make it work and 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 how do you overcome that that's the that's the thing i'm just more optimistic i think because whenever i talk to people even from very conservative type churches there's always this kind of x factor in their life which they haven't been able to manage and put their finger on so when you ask anybody you know about their confidence in God. You won't get this well-rounded theology back. No. You'll get this weird experience they had, you know, that they haven't been able to get over. So it's kind of like the Latin and the tongues. It's the same thing, isn't it? It's kind yeah. of like the view that is not actually responding to the, the kind of logical framework, the kind of language games of the church. It's the bit of you that just something touched you in a way that none of that did. That's really where most people's true foundation of faith is it's the weird stuff that holds it together yeah. so i think maybe churches need to be a bit more weird. Open about that a bit more weird a bit weird <laughs> uh yeah whether they do that by you know really needing miracles in order to just see everyday life be you know bearable or whether they see that through beauty and music and poetry and arts which isn't my thing but i think it's exactly the same drive yeah, I know. I agree. My, I guess you're you're getting my. I I completely agree with you. Uh, what? <laughs> I do. I really. But but my. You're going to agree? This is not us, Al. We, we're going to we're going to fall down the rabbit hole. This is not us. <laughs> <laughs> but here's my suspicion: <laughs> the defaults of the aesthetic, I find, is so powerful, even amongst yeah. leaders. So rather than, in other words, I, I, I mean, I agree with you. I, I, I sit in church on a Sunday and I listen to ministers and I go, you've got to be kidding. And I, and I look around and I go, don't you get that these people are hungering for, to use your language, the weirdness and the mystery of God. And all you give them is drivelly morality or personal spirituality. But, but my fear is, particularly in middle-class cultures, that that mystery gets turned back into a personal aesthetic. It's called spirituality. Mm. And, and I, how, do you, how does that mystery, that experience of the mystery, how does it get turned into the questions of, we can't live, we can't thrive as human beings, in this neoliberal world? I am not sure how that happens. Yeah, I, I'm not asking for an answer. I'm just... No, I mean, I think I'm, I'm thinking what changes anybody to... It's very hard, you know, we, 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 we've got such an echo chamber around us, haven't we? Like subcultures do that very, very well. So you never hear the stuff that, that isn't in your world. Adversity is probably the only thing that really makes you drive down your roots and find out what you really do believe and where you really do stand. So, you know, adversity is coming to the West for sure. And in terms of faith, that's probably a gift, isn't it? 
It is, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about that. I was thinking, well, why do our communities, why are they so much better at shared living? Because it's not that they've got resources. It's the opposite problem, isn't the it? The opposite, yeah. But they're incredibly generous. And I think that's because they tend to go through adversity together. Whereas I think middle class Christians go through adversity individually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They get serious adversity. <clears throat> it. Yeah. No, there, there's more of a front, right? There's more of a we can't admit that this is really how we feel. This is these are our questions. There's a rawness among people who haven't had that kind of tutoring in their life about what they're allowed to feel and say. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So adversity is gonna help, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's coming. Yeah. Um Perhaps yeah. the institutions themselves are, you know, really getting in the way now. And so the fact that we can afford, for instance, full-time ministers who just basically caretake churches has not really been that helpful to people. No, it's because not. This has it, you know. No, it's not. No. That's probably on its way out as well. I think so. Yeah, I think it's on its yeah. way out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I, I think it's... Um, I, I think I, if I hear you correctly, you, you're right. The, the the quicker we can end the full time minister mentality, I think, I think that will help us immensely um, at reimagining how to be God's people in a much more interdependent way than we have now. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> and we're hitting on something with the local. I think that that's probably a huge part of it. It is. Because Neoliberalism has lost as well, hasn't it? This idea of any place being particularly your place. You know, I mean, we, we've had it under Thatcherism here. You know, so the idea that you can just decimate whole working class communities around industries. And that doesn't matter because those people can be trained to work in call centres. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> plug them in somewhere else. <laughs> that's demonic. You know, it that's demonic, yeah. That yeah. kind of says to people, your place, your history, your story is completely irrelevant get on your bike and go find a job. <laughs> right? That's, yeah. that's on it, right? Yeah. So people have been through that and I think are oh, now seeing that we, we can't live without this sense of bonding. Right. We, we desperately, desperately unhappy, anxious people. And uh, have you seen the YouTube film Rat Park? No. It What's it called? Oh, Rat, Rat, Park. Rat Park. Rat Park. Rodent Park the fun place to play. It's about addiction. And uh, I just, it, it's, it's, a, it's a theory that counteracts everything you think you know about addiction. Yeah. So basically, I understood addiction, I'll be quick, by putting rats in cages and giving them an option of drugged water or ordinary water. They all choose the, the drugged water. They all not only use, they overuse, and vast numbers of them will kill themselves. Yeah. yeah and then um, a psychologist looked at these experiments and said, well, what if it's not the drug? What if it's the cage? And built a rat park, which no. was the size of a cage. Um, a population of 20 rats, which is the ideal rat community. <laughs> Opportunities to mate, toys, a variation of food, challenges. And what they found was not only the drugged water was hardly used, but no rat overdosed. No kidding. Not a single rat overdosed in Rat Park. And so when people ask me what we're doing, you know, we're here in the Rat Park. <laughs> we're building a Rat Park. <laughs> we're building a Rat Park. That's why we need a playing field and we need a football team and we need a, you know, we're building a Rat Park. Humans can't live in neoliberalism. But churches can build Rat Parks. We've got resources. We've got people. We've got a Christian hope that says it's worth it have an imago day which says that you know we are all made in the image of god there yeah. is no us that's a rat yeah we're not rats yeah you know? so i think this is what the church can do we just need to build communities where people can live humanely together and all the problems that come up when you do that but yeah, i that, in it oh that that that's thank you that that is a uh with an image and a metaphor but a reality that <clears throat> For me, it clarifies a lot. That, that, There's a great um, TED talk on it. There's a great TED talk. I mean, it's it's in the field of addiction. But that's okay. The, the, the yeah. um, because yeah, neoliberalism puts us into a rat cage. 
It does. And no wonder we take drugs, right? We keep feeding the drug of we've got to make more, we've got to make more, we've got to make more. It depends on us. Yeah. Which is why, like right now in North America, there are all these articles and everything coming out about the epidemic of loneliness, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> but nobody addresses the fact that, to use your metaphor, mm. there's a good reason for the epidemic of loneliness. Yeah. It's called neoliberalism's rat cage. That's right. That's but, right. But nobody, nobody seems to address that. And therefore, the vocation of God's people is yeah. that local. And it doesn't yeah. matter. The class issue then starts to become less the yeah. big thing. Yeah. What does it mean if we become, <clears throat> for us to learn how to become those yeah. who are yeah. creating rap parks? <laughs> and, but, but seriously, and, and in the creating of rap, rap parks, our, our vocation is to keep asking yeah. this yeah. crazy question, what's God doing here? And how do we become human? You know, how do we become yeah. human? Yeah. I think you can learn a lot from the lives of women because I was wondering why women are so good. Oh, there at... we go. You got back to that one. Okay. <laughs> I'm okay. just kidding. I've, I've done the class. Now I'm doing the feminism. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's something about the loneliness of being stuck at home with young children, which is not all women's experience, but by gosh, it hits a lot of women. Yeah. We absolutely drives them to communality because they know that it is a complete lie that they can live these happy fulfilled lives with a beautiful house and the one you know that the beautiful kids they know that actually they need human connection I can't survive I couldn't survive childhood without a serious group of friends I needed yeah <laughs> I, asked, I asked people a little bit this was last year you know what's good about the church and um nobody said uh the teaching yeah. <laughs> Hit me, you know. Nobody worship. The bit that people loved, hang on, something I must say, was when we take casseroles round when they had a baby. You wouldn't believe how many people mentioned. Yeah. I felt loved by the church when I had my kids and you bought me two weeks of food. Isn't that wonderful? Community of kindness. Yeah, yeah. That actually creates a human environment where yeah. people stop being addicted to stuff. Yeah bonded with stuff because there's not enough people in our lives that's right yeah we need people to be human you know there's the social trinity isn't it it is we're made in that image of god we are intrinsically built for community just like yeah. how it is yeah just lost our connection to people and adversity like when you're stuck at home with three kids under five on my life that was the time that you dig into your community you know, and you find those people and you don't care their background. That's right. You, you just want to be with people. And I think men are missing that. I think you're right. I think yeah. you're absolutely right, yeah. So we need to do some things that make men feel a little more connected to people. You know, I'd give everyone a four day week and, uh, and, and serious efforts to give men proper parental leave as they do in Sweden. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm expectation of all humans that there's going to be parts of your life that you're not a worker but you're productive and your productivity isn't coming from capitalism it's coming from your humanity if we could gift that to men we'd change some stuff right it would be phenomenal it really it would, would be great and, and part of what you're saying is that in, in god's economy <clears throat> You don't take on neoliberalism by having big arguments about capitalism and that. You you actually again to go back. How do we create thriving rat box <laughs> in our local contexts? Uh, that, yeah. That's the work. That's the work. You uh, need toys. You need you know. You need to have some fun together as communities. Yeah. To do all those things and challenge. You need challenge. The yeah. rats are better because they had challenge. And you, 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 need, you need people around you, you know? Right. I don't know what the ideal size of a community is, but it's certainly not the size that we're, you know, the kind of, the idea that we can have so many thousand friends on Facebook. Right. This is utterly absurd. Well, it's, it's evil. <laughs> it's evil. It's demonic. There's another one. Yeah. You know? yeah. But here's a nice example. So we baptised this, uh, we had two baptisms on Sunday. One guy, an Iranian asylum seeker, and uh, he's, uh, 
he's got a pretty grim life here in London because he gets about 50 quid a week to live off. Wow. He's fled to this country because he's become a Christian. He's a Muslim convert. And he's going to be here for at least another six months before his wife even stands a chance of joining him. So we did his baptism. He's lovely. We've known him for a few months. And uh, he's a great guy, lovely Christian. And afterwards, I just thought, we have to do something about the, the, this guy's life. We're giving him food. He, come, he met us through the food bank. He's learning English. We've got an English class. But you know what I thought he missed? He's missing fun. You know, so we, we, had this, we have these WhatsApp groups. We organise most of our stuff through WhatsApp, you know. And so I just sent two, one to the women's WhatsApp, which is about 20 odd women, and another to the church leaders and just said, I've got this idea, probably because we just dunked him. You know, this guy used to, on his baptism, he used to love swimming. He took part of his testimony was about God saving his life when he was scuba diving. Mm. Anyway, so yeah, weird stuff, right? Yeah, so I cool. just put this thing out and I, I figured out that we could get him an off peak day pass for 24 quid a month. So he could use the gym and the swimming pool locally, 24 quid a month. And I just put this out and said, would 12 of us like to do this? Within, within the hour, my phone was pinging away. I didn't even get my own name on the rotor hour. <laughs> there was too many. So I got 10 people so quick. And I said, okay, me and Dave will do the last two. And then two people came back and said, no, I really want to do this. Yeah. And so that's church, right? That is it, yeah. Yeah. That is church. Yeah. We're not meeting his needs. He doesn't need to go to the gym and swim. But we understand what is life like if you've got nothing in your week other than English classes. Mm. Thanks. Everyone needs some fun. You know, yeah. everyone. Yeah.